Vision. Hey everyone, Dave here, and right now I'm geeking out over the greatest game ever made, King's Quest VI. Dave's Obsession! Dave's Obsession of the Moment! When I was recently revisiting the King's Quest franchise to relive its most frustrating deaths, I unsurprisingly found myself sucked right back into King's Quest VI, Air Today, Gone Tomorrow. Undoubtedly the pinnacle of the series, King's Quest VI features everything there is to love from previous King's Quest games, executed to its full potential. For the first time, series creator Roberta Williams had a co-writer, Jane Jensen, who went on to create Gabriel Knight, and the two of them together made a powerhouse team. Jensen helped shape Williams' traditional, delightful hodgepodge of fairy tales into a more cohesive narrative than the King's Quest games usually provided, unifying the various mythologies into a single, fantastic yet believable world. Daventry and its neighboring kingdoms would fracture fairy tales and draw from legends at random, often to charming effect, but the Land of the Green Isles was the first time I truly believed that all of these legends could coexist. Of course, part of that is due to the game's instruction manual, The Guidebook to the Land of the Green Isles, written by Jensen under the guise of King's Quest literary expanded universe mainstay Derek Carla Vagan. Derek's a framing device character who originated in the King's Quest Companion, which is a strategy guide novelization that's a whole separate rabbit trail of nerdery that I'm sure we'll get to some other time. The main purpose of this guidebook is copy protection, providing essential clues to a few key puzzles, but this guidebook went above and beyond, weaving these clues into the local mythology and expanding on other pieces of mythology that come up in the game, providing extra knowledge that's fascinating but not required. Things like the local traditions regarding death or the known history of genies and their various addictions. There's a whole recounting of a local fairy tale about a famous genie that doesn't factor into the game at all, but is still completely consistent with the game's portrayal of genies. We are at remarkable levels of world building and backstory here, and we're still talking about the manual. Let's shift to the gameplay and the front story. The game follows Prince Alexander of Daventry, voiced here by Robbie Benson, fresh off what is still the greatest movie in the Disney animated canon. Alexander returns as protagonist for the first time since King's Quest III, back when he thought his name was Gwydion, and here his wardrobe is directly inspired by Kevin Costner in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, as, I'm pretty sure, was the decision to play a ludicrously emotional, melodramatic love ballad over the end credits. But I'm getting ahead of myself, we're not even to the opening credits yet. As the incredibly dated, but trust me it was impressive for the time opening cutscene shows, Alexander's pining for Princess Cosima, whom he met in passing during the final cutscene of King's Quest V. My lady, I am deeply in your debt, and I will make it up to you. With your permission, I'd like to travel to the land of the Green Isles to see you. Apparently that emotionless exchange was love at first sight for both of them. But he has no idea where her homeland is, so he fears he'll never see her again. And at his deepest despair, the magic mirror shows him his love interest trapped in a tower, just as it did for his father before him. And apparently he gets a better look at the stars than the audience does, because he's determined he can find his way to her home in the land of the Green Isles via their navigation. The stars! I saw the stars outside her window. I can navigate by the stars. Oh, Alexander. Then there's like 10 minutes of showing off how cool the seagulls are. Yeah, that goes on for a while. Okay, okay, the game's not 100% perfect, but literally no game is. I mean, every other game has flaws. Like, they all share the flaw of not being King's Quest VI. These seagulls may seem pointless now, but they were really impressive for the time, and I still enjoy this sequence, mostly for the beautiful music, which I swear is a cover of Bus Stop by the Hollies. Every morning I would see her waiting at the stop. Sometimes she'd shop, and then she'd show me what she bought. All the people stared as if we were both quite insane. Someday my name and hers are going to be the same. Anyway, Alexander's been sailing for three months, but he finally spies land, and the pirates who don't do anything here are just so ecstatic that they end up breaking the ship. <laughs> The 
game begins proper with Alexander alone on the beach, unsure where he is. While the gameplay is fairly continuous and not really delineated into narrative acts like the Monkey Island games are, it still has the vague shape of a five-act structure. Act 1 is finding a way off the Isle of the Crown, which leads you to a magic map that can teleport you from island to island. Amazingly enough, not the first time Alexander's had a teleporting magic map. And later, Robbie Benson's more famous character got a teleporting magic atlas, but not until after he was played by not Robbie Benson. So now you have an island hopper pass, and while each act requires you to visit multiple islands for supplies, they each focus on one island apiece. Act 2 focuses on the Isle of Wonder, a Lewis Carroll-inspired whimsy domain, and the biggest challenge here is getting onto the island past the gnome guards by fooling one sense at a time. Act 3 focuses on the Isle of the Sacred Mountain, where first you have to scale the mighty cliffs of copy protection, and then you have to navigate a labyrinth and defeat a minotaur. But I ranted about that last time. You can talk to an oracle when you succeed, so that's nice. Act 4 focuses on the Isle of the Beast, where Alexander has to instigate a certain tale as old as time that Robbie Benson just can't seem to shake. At least this version draws more from traditional fairy tales and Cocteau than Trousdale and Wise. And finally, Act 5 involves infiltrating the castle and saving the princess, but there's more than one potential Act 5 path. There is more than one way into this place. Your choice will dictate much. Here's the thing. In order to properly praise King's Quest VI, First, I need to spend a little bit of time crapping on King's Quest V. King's Quest V was a huge step forward for the series, abandoning the text parser for a cursor system, introducing higher res graphics, and featuring recorded voices for the first time in the series. And some of these steps forward, they knocked out of the park. King's Quest V is a beautiful looking game, showcasing a vast and inviting world that looks ripe for exploration. And the broad story beats were intriguing, expanding the mythology of the franchise by showing the repercussions of King's Quest III. The voices, on the other hand... Hey, watch out! A poison snake! The voice cast is primarily made up of Sierra employees, and God bless them, they're trying. Josh Mandel is good as Graham, or at least as good as the dialogue would allow. He's dead, all right. He turned himself into a fire, and I put him out with rainwater. And he'd reprise the role in one possible ending of King's Quest VI, and in several King's Quest fan projects. But many of the supporting voices are miscast at best. Some of them lack the energy or emotion required for the role. Oh, she hasn't been doing too well lately. But my brother and I help out whenever we can. Some of them are just really obviously faking a voice. Under the crystal cave, there you will find the yeti. And some of them might be good if they were reading better dialogue. I don't know what I have that would be of much use to you. Most of my wizard stuff is pretty old and worn out. Sierra had to learn the hard way that dialogue you hear spoken has different demands than dialogue you read in a little text box. The narrator in particular is probably the most essential role since it's the voice you hear more than any other voice in the game, and... Graham gives the wand a good shake, but it only fizzles and dies. The nicest thing I could say about him is he sounds like a heavily sedated Dick Van Dyke. A man's home may be his castle, but very often his teeth are not his own. <laughs> But those shortcomings can be chalked up to awkward experimentation and learning by doing. What's less forgivable is how narrow the game path is. I've spoken before about Adventure Gaming's reputation for a lack of replayability, and how games with more variety to them tend to stand out in the genre. King's Quest V has virtually no variety. I don't think it's possible to win the game without receiving every single point. Even King's Quest I had alternate solutions to nearly every puzzle. Some of them would lose you points, but they'd still serve as acceptable stepping stones to completing the game. There's no alternate solutions in King's Quest V. You have to solve each puzzle in the exact right way, no matter how nonsensical some of those ways are. As such, this seemingly vast and explorable world is actually an incredibly claustrophobic and demanding pathway that's too unclear to be easy to follow. I seem to be stuck. I don't know where to go from here. And so, one of the most magical things about King's Quest VI is that it somehow fixes every single thing that was wrong with King's Quest V. The most immediately apparent fix was splurging in the budget to hire actual actors. In addition to Benson, we're treated to a murderer's row of vocal talent, including legends like Don Messick. Hello, I will be right up. Grumplump knows a tasty treat. Rusie Taylor. I assume you do not intend to leave me tied up on this vile monstrosity. I have a terrible ache in my mouth. 
I've never seen a rose of white. Chuck McCann. I'm sorry, but I have no time for idle conversation. I'm too worried about the princess. Townsend Coleman. You fool. You've been eating those mints again. I ordered you to stop that. Ah, uh, yes. Master. And Tony freaking J. Prince Alexander of Daventry, I presume. I'm afraid I'm unfamiliar with your country, but I'm sure Wazir al Hazred will want to meet you, if indeed you are a friend of the princess. <laughs> I love it. And as for the narrator, is Flint enough of an upgrade for you? Long ago, in the castle of a kingdom called Daventry. That's right, the dulcet tones of Bill Ratner guide you through this adventure, and what a blessing on the ears he is. Alexander never was much good at squash. You sell those Sierra narrator dad puns, Bill Ratner. But most of all, this game not only does away with the rigidity of King's Quest V, it runs so far in the opposite direction, it's kind of unbelievable. The alternate endings of this game were highly publicized, and we will get to those in a moment, but even as early as Act 1, you're given a hint at the kind of freedom this game might provide. When the game begins, Alexander doesn't know where he is, so he needs to find someone to ask. You immediately face a crossroads leading to a village or a castle. You might be thinking, oh, I'm a prince looking for a princess, I'll try the castle first. So you go talk to the humanoid canines whose species apparently exists only to guard the royals, and find out where you are. Am I anywhere near the land of the Green Isles? This is the land of the Green Isles! The Isle of the Crown is the main island, foolish boy! Then Princess Cosima must live in this very castle. Then, after you know this is Kazima's castle, you can try to get in. I assure you, I am Prince Alexander of Daventry. And I assure you that you'll not get past me without proof. Oh, it's proof the game wants, is it? Eh, I got your frickin' proof. Perhaps this ring will convince you of my identity. It is the Royal Insignia Ring of Daventry. I'm sure. Just let me take a look at that ring. Well, uh, I'm sorry, your highness. It's just that princes are so uncommon in these parts. Let me get Captain Saladin. And a lesser game might have required you to go to the castle first for exposition, or just included it in the opening cutscene. As was her parents' wish, Cassima and I are to be wed. On the other hand, what if you want to start off with the common man's perspective? Then, you don't have to go to the castle first, you can go to the village and get your exposition from the pawn shop guy or the bookseller. This is the Isle of the Crown, the main isle of the land of the Green Isles. Thank the fates! And then if you go to the castle after that, your introductory dialogue is completely different. Yeah, so everyone says, let me just look at that ring. What does it say, Gruff? Kingdom of Daventry? Prince Alexander. Ah, wait here while I go see what Captain Saladin thinks of this. Sure, it's a minor and consequential detail that barely affects the actual gameplay, but to pull it off they had to write all this non-overlapping alternate dialogue and program it so that it would all be cohesive based on the decisions the player had made earlier. And that demonstrates a commitment to going above and beyond for the immersive experience. Yeah, they didn't write completely new dialogue based on every single thing the player could try. I really must get inside the castle to see the princess. Perhaps this will convince you. But they still went a lot further with it than expected, considering they made zero effort in the previous game, and a lot further than they needed to, considering that most players would only experience at most 30% of the dialogue. I mean, hell, you don't even have to go to the castle in Act 1. You can just put it off until Act 5. If you don't meet the Vizier before you get the magic map, rather than saying, I follow Prince Alexander as you <laughs> wished, the genie says, I was a smurfling <laughs> in the village as you wished, and I saw a major, I don't know, a danger, no, 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 a Stranger there. <laughs> and then the game keeps track of the fact that you never met the vizier, so if you ever try to go back to the castle, rather than saying, Be gone! You're not welcome at the castle, Prince Alexander of Daventry! We have our orders, and they are quite clear! The guards say, I am Prince Alexander of Daventry, and I would like... Prince Alexander of Daventry? He's the one, Wolf! See here now! We've been warned about you, 
Wazir al Hazred has issued strict orders that you're not to be allowed anywhere near the castle. Me? But. But I haven't even met the Wazir. And even at the very end of the game, instead of saying. Prince Alexander, here. The Wazir will have my head for allowing you within a mile of the royal wedding. Captain Saladin says. <laughs> You must be the foreigner the Wazir warned me about. Again, minor touches, but demonstrative of an unprecedented commitment to this sort of detail in this series. The earlier games had alternate solutions and paths, but your choice of path didn't have consequences beyond your inventory and points bar. Here it actually shapes the story's flourishes. So, about those alternate endings. Uh, famously, there are two main paths for Act 5, the easy path and the hard path and the main difference between them is whether or not you cast spells. If you don't, you sneak into the castle in drag and ruffle around upstairs for a bit before stopping the wedding and fighting the bad guy. If you do use magic, you go to the land of the dead, challenge the Lord of Death for the souls of Kasima's parents, paint your way into the castle, and do a bunch of optional stuff if you want the super happy ending. But at the end of both paths, countless other choices you make throughout the game affect the individual moments in the final cutscene. Like, where Alexander's ring ended up. Do you have a ring? I have my insignia ring. I have Alexander's royal insignia ring. Uh, I'm afraid I... I left my insignia ring in the pawn shop. Or whether or not you met Jalo. If you did, he's stoked about this wedding. He's just thrilled that his two best friends got together. But if you didn't meet him, he doesn't know who you are, he's not particularly invested. And yes, if you took the hard path, Cosima's parents will be there. But if you still killed the genie instead of capturing him, your family won't be. And if you never found the treasures from the other islands, their leaders will still be at war, so they won't feel like showing up to your wedding. But if you follow the hard path and discover every secret and get the genie and score every point, the game will be very impressed with you. And then it'll suggest you try the easy way, because come on, we put a lot of work into this and we want you to see all of it. Do you know how expensive all those dialogues recording sessions were, play it compulsively until you've seen it all and appreciate all the freedom we gave you. Right about now, you might be saying something like, uh, but Dave, plenty of other games nowadays account for this type of freedom. In fact, most of them do. Why are you trying to impress me with this? This has already been built upon and improved upon. And to that I say, you're probably right. I'm not really much of a gamer, and I'm in no way qualified to declare the greatest game of all time, but uh, apparently the only way to internet success is to treat your subjective taste like objective fact for the sake of clickbait, and this is definitely my favorite game of all time. King's Quest VI perfects the feeling of wonder and danger that runs throughout the franchise, and King's Quest VI is the game where this world feels the most real. Even though most of the game-spanning reactions to the different choices you make are largely cosmetic, they still help you feel like you actually shape the story, rather than just react to it. I would love a high-def re-release of this game. Not a ground-up remake with brand new graphics, but just an HD remaster where they rescan the original art assets in high definition and use better compression on the dialogue, but even if such a thing is possible, it's incredibly unlikely to happen since most recent King's Quest re-releases just lump the games together with a copy of DOSBox, so you can't even play this with Windows 3.1 level graphics unless you use a different emulator, or just have a computer that can still run Windows 3.1 programs. But hey, maybe the low graphics resolution is part of the charm for you. Either way, I highly recommend seeking this game out and playing it compulsively. Explore every nook and cranny. Don't rest until you've seen it all. And until next time, this is Dave, signing off. Hello, I am Prince Alexander of Daventry, and, and I'm the king now. See this crown that I'm wearing? It's, it's me. I am now King Alexander. Look at my crown. Yeah, well, I'm the fairy guy, and now I'm the king, because I'm wearing the crown now. See, this game even has its own built-in minigame. Who wants to be king?